St. Francis of Assisi, a biography, by Johannes Jorensen, translated by Thomas O'Connor Sloan. Author's Preface The fruit of several years of study is here submitted to the circle of northern readers. More than once it has seemed that this book would never be finished. Modern Franciscan research has developed to so widespread and erratic a science that those who once get into it are in danger of never getting out of it again. Even Paul Sabatier told me, in a conversation I had with him in Rome in 1903, that he found it difficult to preserve a comprehensive viewpoint. Now, however, when I have succeeded in completing my book, it has become possible for me to pay my tribute of thanks on all sides. First of all, I thank my wife, who in her time zealously advised me and by personal sacrifice contributed to the carrying out of my plan of a trip devoted to Franciscan studies. I next owe my thanks to those who gave me material assistance, both for the necessary preliminary studies as well as for the final development and production. My especial thanks are due to Baroness L. Stamp Cheresis, Baroness P. Rosenorn Lane, as well as to the directors of the Carlsberg Endowment, especially Professor Dr. Edward Holm, also Professor Carl Larson, and my publisher, Director Ernst Bojensen, are heartily thanked for the interest they showed in my work. My thanks are again due to all who by personal interest have facilitated my studies. First I thank Countess H. Holstein Lederborg, who by her translation into German of my Pilgrimsbog, undertaken with such great devotion, has more than once paved the way for me and opened doors and hearts. I must next name a number of Franciscans, above all Reverend David Fleming, who by his commendation as Vicar General of the Order made it possible for me my pilgrimage in 1903 through Franciscan Italy. Next, the historian of the Franciscan Order, Reverend Leonard Lemons, and the guardian and fathers in the different convents which I visited on the above-named journey, especially Reverend Pacifico in Greccio, Reverend Giovanni da Greccio in Fonte Colombo, Reverend Teodoro da Carpinetto in the convent of La Foresta, Reverend Vincenzo Stefano Jacobi in Cortona, Reverend Saturnino da Caprese, and Reverend Samuel Sharon de Guersac at Laverna. I give hearty thanks again to Reverend Don Severino, pastor in Poggio Bustone, and to the learned engineer Albert Provarioni of the same place, to the Capuchins in Celle, and to the Redemptorists in Cortona, under whose hospitable roof I found refuge in the days I passed in the city of St. Margaret. With special recognition, I give my thanks to the brothers Matucci, who gave me a home in Poggio Bostone and helped me in my work. I only wish that I could extend this list enough to include even a part of all who showed me friendship and hospitality in my wanderings. For those who know Italian people, this seems very natural. But the present book might never have been completed if I had not found a place of refuge in the Franciscan convent at Frauenburg, where next door to my room I had a rich library of Franciscan literature from the earliest to the most recent time. The second half, third and fourth books with the conclusion of the appendix were written there. Should my work seem to have any worth, a due portion of the honor for its existence is due to Rev. Maximilian Brandes, provincial of the Franciscan province of Thuringia, to which Fraunberg belongs, to Rev. Pacificus Boehner, now in Gorheim by Sigmaringen, as well as to the guardian of Fraunberg, Rev. Saturnine Gare, who with such great hospitality and affection regarded me for six weeks as a member of his great convent family. I also thank the willing and friendly fathers who tried to help in every way, and especially must I thank my tireless and devoted friend, Rev. Michael Beale, by whose ever-ready assistance so many stones were removed from my road. I shall never forget the summer evenings in the convent gardens of Fraunberg, 
when we walked up and down the long walk as the sun, large and red, sank behind the trees, and I told him of my day's work and sought Pater Michael's practical opinion, sometimes on one, sometimes on another difficult point. And thus I take leave of this work which has so long been the center of my labor and research. To write about St. Francis of Assisi should have been his own affair, for what does he himself say in the Speculum Perfectionis? The Emperor Charlemagne, Roland, Holger, and all the other knights of the round table fought the heathen unto death and won the victory over them and at the end became themselves holy martyrs and died in the battle for the faith of Christ. But now there are many who, by simply telling of their actions, hope to win honor and fame for mankind. Also, there are now many who, by simply preaching on what the saints have done, wish to win honor and fame. Deep and wise, therefore, was the saying of Francis, Man has as much of knowledge as is executed, tantum homo habet de scientia, quantum operatur. The ultimate measure of wisdom is to serve and to properly conduct one's life. Worth is only attained by putting into practice. Therefore, there is a practical and moral design behind all the literary diligence of the old authors of legends. Thus also a modern biographer of St. Francis, who would really be inspired by the spirit of St. Francis of Assisi, like the old convent brother writers, must utter the words, Fox secundum exemplar, learn from Francis, that ideals ought to be put into practice. Johannes Jornsson, Fraunberg, Feast of St. Clara of Assisi, 1906. Book 1, Francis the Church Builder, Chapter 1, The Convalescent There awoke one morning in Assisi a young man who was just recovering from a severe illness. It was 700 years ago. The hour was an early one. The window blinds were not yet opened. Out of doors the day's business was in full blast. The bells for Mass had long ago rung out from St. Maria del Vescovado, which lay almost under the windows. The strong morning light streamed in through the crack where the window blinds met. The young man knew it all so well. One morning after another, the long weeks of his convalescence had passed thus. Soon his mother would come in and draw the shutters aside and the light would enter in dazzling brightness. Then he would get his morning draft, and his bed would be made over. He used to lie on one side of the wide bed, while the other was made up for him. And so he would lie there, tired but at peace, and look out on the blue cloudless autumn sky, listening to the splashing on the stones of the street as the people of the neighborhood threw their wastewater out of the windows. As the forenoon advanced, the rays of the sun began to come in, first along the high wall of the window alcove, then right across the brick floor of the room. And when they approached the bed, it was time to take the midday meal. After midday, the blinds were again closed, and he took his siesta in the quiet, comfortable obscurity of the room. Then he awoke, and the blinds were again thrown open to admit the light. The sun had left the window, but if he raised himself up in the bed, he could see the mountains under a blue veil on the other side of the plain, and soon the crimson evening red of the late autumn day burned in the western sky. As the darkness quickly fell, he heard the noise of sheep, which were driven bleeding into the stable, and the peasants and peasant girls who sang on their way home from the fields. They were the wonderful, heart-gripping folk songs of Umbria which the invalid heard, the songs which even today are in the people's mouths, and whose slow, wonderfully melancholy tones fill the soul with sadness till it is ready to burst with helpless longing and melancholy. At last the songs ceased, and it was night. 
Over the distant mountains gleamed a single bright star. When that showed itself, it was time to close the shutters and to light the night lamp, the lamp which in the long nights of fever had constantly burned through the long hours of his uneasy dreams. Today there was to be a change. Today at last he was to have permission to leave his bed. How glad he was to go into the other rooms, to see and touch all the things he had so long missed and had been so near losing forever. He must even venture down into the business offices, see the people come and do business, see the clerks measure the good Tuscan cloth with their yardsticks, and draw in the bright ringing coins. Just as the young man was busy with these dreams, the door opened. As on every morning of his illness, it was his mother who entered. As she threw the shutters aside, he saw that she carried, as she brought his morning meal, a suit of man's clothes over her arms. I have had a new suit of clothes made for you, my Francis, she said as she laid them down at the foot of the bed. And as he finished his meal, she sat down by the window while he dressed himself. What a lovely morning it is, she said, almost as if she were talking to herself. How brightly the sun shines. I see all the houses over in Betona so clearly, although there is the whole extent of the broad plain between us, and out in the middle of the green vineyards Isola Romanesca lies like an island in a lake, and smoke is rising straight up from all the chimneys, as if from a censer in a church. Ah, it seems to me, my Francis, that on such a morning as this, Heaven and earth are as beautiful as a church on a feast day, and that all creatures praise, love, and thank God. To these words, Francis gave no answer but silence. But a moment later he broke out as he ceased his dressing. How weak I am! His mother changed the current of her remarks and their tone. It is always so when one has been sick, she said brightly. As long as you lie in bed, you think that you can do anything, but as soon as you get your feet from under the covers, you find that it is different. I know this from my own experience, and therefore I had the foresight to bring a stick for you. And she went to the door and brought in a beautiful polished stick with an ivory handle. Soon after, the mother and son together left the sick room. Some time passed before Francis could venture to go out of his home alone. He and his mother had visited all the rooms. They had been down in the shop where the clerks had greeted them with a hearty and delighted, Good morning, Madonna Pica. Good morning and welcome back, Signorino Francesco. But Francis had to go further than through rooms and shop, further than through the house. He must go out and greet the fields and vineyards greet the open heaven and look far over the wide fertile plain. And now he stood outside the city gate on the road which goes to Foligno along the foot of Monte Subiaco. Here he stood supported by his stick and looked out. Directly in front of him was a vineyard. The vines were festooned from tree to tree. Heavy blue branches hung under the broad leaves. Soon it will be the grape harvest and the beautiful time of wine pressing. Further down the slope were the olive groves that extended over the plain and covered it with a silver gray veil. Here and there appeared the white buildings and farmhouses under a veil of mist, which now towards midday began to rise out of the earth. The most distant building seemed hardly larger than little white stones. Francis saw it all yet not as he should have seen it. That excess of delight with which the sight of the landscape's bright colors and of the mountain's fine outline against the clear sky formerly affected him was missing. It was as if the heart which formerly had beaten so young and strongly in his breast had suddenly grown old. It seemed to him as if he never again could enjoy anything he felt too hot in the sun and retreated to the shadow of a wall. 
His knees were too weak to let him go down the hill. He also was hungry and caught himself dreaming of a good dinner and of a glass of wine. And like a shudder, the sensation went through him that his youth was gone that the things which he had believed would constantly give him peace would now give him no joy, that all that he had thought to be a treasure which never could be taken from him, the sunshine, the blue heaven, the green fields, all that he in his convalescence, weary days, had so bitterly longed for, like an exiled king for his kingdom, that all this in his hands was now worthless, smoldering, and going to ashes, like the palms of Palm Sunday burned and reduced to the ashes which the priest on Ash Wednesday puts upon the heads of the faithful with the sad and truthful words, Remember, man, of dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. It was all dust, dust and nothing but dust, and ashes, death, and judgment, mortality, and vanity. All was vanity. Francis stood there a long time and looked into space. It was as though he saw the future blossoming before his eyes. Slowly he turned away, and leaning heavily on his stick, went back to Assisi. For him the day was come of which the Lord spoke to the prophet I will spread thy path with thorns. The day when a mysterious hand writes words of death and corruption on the walls of the feast chamber. But like all who are in the first steps of their conversion, the young man immediately thought as much of the failings of others as of his own. For as he saw the change that had taken place in himself, his thoughts were directed to his friends with whom he had so often stood there and admired the beautiful view. How foolish they are that they love perishable things, he thought within himself, with a sort of feeling of superiority as he went back to the city gate. Chapter 2, Infancy and Youth Francesco, or as we say in our language, Francis, had that morning just completed his 22nd year and was the eldest son of one of the richest men of Assisi, the great cloth merchant Pietro de Bernardone. The family was not indigenous to Assisi. Pietro's father, Bernardone, or great Bernard, had come from Lucca and belonged to the renowned Lucan family of weavers and merchants, the Morricone. Francis's mother, Fru Pica, was of still more distant origin, Ser Pietro had made her acquaintance on one of his business trips in beautiful legendary Provence and took her home as his bride to the little Italian village under the mountain declivity of Subasio. Assisi is one of the oldest cities of Italy. Even in the books of Ptolemy, it is called Assision, and in the year 46 BC, the Latin poet Propertius was born there. Christianity was brought to this region by St. Crispolitus, or Crispoldo, according to the legend the disciple of St. Peter as well as of St. Bricius, Bishop of Spoleto, who at the command of the Prince of the Apostles in the year 58 is said to have consecrated St. Crispoldo as Bishop in Vetona, now Betona, and to have assigned him the charge over the whole district from Foligno in the south to Nocera in the north. Under the persecutions of Domitian, St. Crispaldo suffered martyrdom. The same fate overtook later three of Umbria's bishops, St. Victorinus, about 240, St. Sabinus, 303, and St. Brafinus, who was the apostle of Assisi. In honor of the last named, there was erected in Assisi, in the middle of the 12th century, the beautiful Romanesque Basilica of San Rufino, after the designs of John of Gubbio, and when it was completed, it became the cathedral of the place, replacing the very old church by the bishop's palace, Santa Maria del Vescovado. And in this church of San Rufino still stands the Romanesque baptismal font 
in which the firstborn of Ser Pietro and Madonna Pica received the water of holy baptism one day in September 1182. It is said to have been the 26th. A legend which is not older than the 15th century says that while Madonna Pica's hour with Francis was come, the child could not be born. Then a pilgrim knocked at the door, and when it was opened, said that the child would not be born until the mother left the beautiful bedroom, went into the stable, and there lay upon straw in one of the stalls. This was done, and hardly was the change effected when the heart-rending cries of the mother ceased, and she bore a son, whose first cradle, like that of the Savior, was a manger full of straw in a stable. Bartholomew of Pisa, who wrote in the end of the 14th century, and who in his work Liber Conformitatum, goes very far in drawing analogies between Jesus Christ and St. Francis, knew nothing of this story, yet it would have exactly suited the scope of his book. On the other hand, Benozzo Gazzoli, in the year 1452, painted the birth in the stable upon the walls of the church of St. Francis in Montefalco, and Sedulius, whose Historia Seraphica appeared in Antwerp in the year 1613, says that he saw the stable in Assisi converted into a chapel. Even today, this chapel can be found in Assisi. It is called San Francesco il Piccolo, St. Francis the Little. And over the door can be read the following inscription, Hoc oratorium fuit bovis et assini stabulum inquonatus est franciscus mundi speculum. This oratory was the stable of ox and ass in which St. Francis, the mirror of the world, was born. The chapel is not far from the place where now the house of the father of St. Francis is shown, and where since the 17th century the Chiesa Nuova, new church, lifts its Baroque walls. The Bolandists have propounded the theory that the chapel may be part of Pietro di Bernardone's original house, which the family later moved out of while Francis was still a child. Perhaps the name of the chapel, Little Francis, led to the development of the legend. Of the same legendary quality as that of the birth in the stable is another tradition that is first given by Wadding. This tells us that the same pilgrim who had given the good advice about the flight to the stable was also in the church at the time of the child's baptism immediately after the birth and held the child over the font. There is still shown in San Rufino's church a stone on which are what resemble footprints. It is told by the guide who shows the stone that the pilgrim, or the angel in guise of a pilgrim, stood upon this stone when St. Francis was baptized. The seed from which this legend has sprung is undoubtedly a tale which still exists in a manuscript of the so-called Legend of the Three Brothers. It is told in it that while the newborn Francis was being baptized, a pilgrim came and knocked at the door and asked to see the child. The maid who opened the door naturally refused this request, but the stranger declared that he would not go until he obtained his wish. Ser Pietro was not at home, and they told the lady of the house what was going on. To the astonishment of all, she ordered them to do what the pilgrim asked. The child was taken out, and as soon as the stranger saw the child, he took it in his arms, just as Simeon had taken the divine infant, and said, Today there have been born in this street two children, and one of them, namely this very child, shall be one of the best men in the world, and the other shall be one of the worst. Bartholomew of Pisa adds that the pilgrim made the sign of a cross upon the right shoulder of the little one, warning the nurse to look well after the child, for the devil strove after its life. And when the stranger had said this, he disappeared before the eyes of all. In baptism, the son of Ser Pietro had received the name of John. 
the father was absent on a journey to France when the child was born, and one of the first things he undertook after his return was to change his firstborn's name from John to Francis. This name was then rare, although not entirely new. It was in use in the immediate neighborhood of Assisi as the name of the road, Via Francesca, which then ran along the west side of the town from San Salvatore degli Pareti, now Casa Gualdi, and ended at San Damiano. This road is referred to by name in a bull of Pope Innocent III, published May 26, 1198, when Francis was only 15 years old, and not yet famous enough to have a road called after him. Many surmises have been made as to why Pietro di Bernardone changed his son's name. The love of the merchant just returning from Provence for France must have been a principal motive. He wished his son to be a real Frenchman in nature and ways. A certain protest against the name-giving by the woman of the house may also have played its part. St. Bonaventure says explicitly, that the name John was given him by his mother. I wish no camel's hair John the Baptist, but a Frenchman with fine nature, is what the father's changing of the name may be thought to have meant. Others hold that the name, the Frenchman, was first bestowed upon the youth as he grew up because of his skill in the French language, a skill which certainly was not very great, as he never could speak the language perfectly. In any case, the youth became familiar from youth with the French tongue. He also learned Latin. This part of his education was undertaken by priests in the neighboring church of St. George. St. Francis's first biographer, Thomas of Chelano, gives us an unpleasant picture of the education of the period. He tells us that children were scarcely weaned before they were taught by their elders to both say and do improper things, and that from false human respect no one dared to behave honorably. And from so bad a twig, no good and healthy tree naturally could spring. A wasted childhood was followed by a riotous youth. Christianity was only a name with the young, and all their ambition was simply in the direction of seeming worse than they were. Thomas of Chelano was a poet and a rhetorician, and it is not easy to know how much weight should be attached to his assertions. Perhaps he thought of the conditions in his own childhood's home, Chelano in the Abruzzi. Of the other biographers, only Julian of Spire has anything of the same sort to say, and he copies it all from Brother Thomas. At an early age, in accordance with a custom still obtaining in Italy, Francis began to assist his father in the shop. He soon showed himself adapted for business, even more than his forebears, Julian Spire, referred to above, says of him in this respect. He was a skillful and active businessman, and lacked only one business trait, but this was also very essential. He was not economical. Rather, was he absolutely wasteful? To understand the cause of this wastefulness, it is necessary to take a look at the period in which the young merchant grew up. It was the end of the 12th century and beginning of the 13th. In other words, it was the flowery time of knighthood and chivalry. Europe's ideal was the knight and the life of chivalry, as it developed in the courts of love in Provence and with the Norman kings in Sicily. In Italy, the minor courts of Este, Verona, and Monteferrato contended with the great republics of Florence and Milan to see who could give the most magnificent tournaments and tilting matches. The most celebrated troubadours of France, Rambaud de Vaqueras, Pierre Vidal, Bernard de Ventadour, Pierre Old d'Auvergne, wandered over the peninsula on endless journeys from court to court and from festival to festival. Everywhere were to be heard the chanson de geste of Provence, fables and ballads. Everywhere were to be heard songs of King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. Even in the smallest cities, the courts of love were established, devoted to the gay science, 
Papa Gaia Sienza. Pietro di Bernardone's French son was, as it were, destined to be caught in this movement. He was not like his father, only the saving, easily contented Italian to whom it was enough to accumulate money. There flowed through his veins also the sparkling blood of Provence. He must have enjoyment by means of his money. He wanted to change gold into splendor and joy. Thus Francis, the richest young man of the place, very naturally became what in our days would be called the leading society man of the town. He was skilled in earning money, but very frivolous in giving it away again, says Thomas of Celano. No wonder that he soon gathered a circle of friends about him, not only from Assisi, but also from the neighboring villages. We even find him seeking a friend in the somewhat distant town of Gubbio. How did these young men spend their time when they were together? Like all young men up to the present day, in taking their meals together, eating well, drinking better, and finally, in high spirits, going through the streets of the city arm in arm, singing at the top of their voices and disturbing the slumbers of the citizens. The austere friar minor from Celano enumerates for us the sins of these wild young men. They joked, he says, were witty, said foolish things, and wore soft, effeminate clothes. I remember a day in May a few years ago, a day in May in Subiaco in the Sabine Hills. I had visited Sagro Specco, St. Benedict's celebrated hermitage cave and Holy Scholastic's convent. I had gone into an inn by the wayside to get a light meal until I could take the train back to Rome via Mandela. I had my meal served in a pleasure house situated on a projecting point of rock so that I looked down between the openings of a screen into a fig orchard's broad-leaved tops lighted by the sun. Over the fig trees I had a view into the valley, where the NEO shining like silver rushed down between blue-gray cliffs, and far away the village of Subiaco, with proud towers and spires, lifted itself up like a castle on a mountaintop. In these cheerful, exalting, and sunny surroundings was a company of youths who were taking their dinner in the same inn with me. Out in an open veranda, which gave a most beautiful view in among the wild mountains, they had had a long table set. I saw the bright white cloth, the mighty flasks, the glasses with the red wine, and the waiters who ran back and forth with great dishes of macaroni and laughter and song arose, but never became ungoverned riot, and they stood up in their places and made speeches, and after the speaking there was a little cornet playing. Such, thought I to myself, were the festivals filled with Italian enjoyment and at the same time with Italian politeness, at which Pietro di Bernardone's son bore the scepter as Rex, as king of the festive party, king for a day and an evening. And if the old Franciscan from Celano had been familiar with the wild inspired drinking songs of the youth of the north, or with the Salomon de Ribbon of the German songs of the Muse, then he would have been milder in passing judgment on these festivals, whose delights were as mild and clear as the yellow wine that ripens on the Umbrian hillsides. But he knew them not, and therefore tells us that Francis was the worst of all the brawling youths, the one who led and misled the others. The gilded youth of Assisi went from feast to feast, and at night they could be heard going through the streets, singing to the accompaniment of the lute or violin, as if they were a wandering band of troubadours or jongleurs. Indeed, so far did Francis go in his admiration for the joyful science of Provence, that he had a party-colored minstrel suit made for himself, which he wore when among his friends. Even at this early time, Francis's father had most probably taken his son as associate in his business. At any rate, the young man had control over considerable sums of money. Everything that he earned went for pleasure. 
Now and then the father could hardly withhold the remark, anyone would think you were a nobleman's son and not the son of a simple merchant. Yet none of his elders cared to restrain Francis in the life he led, and when well-meaning neighbors complained to Madonna Pica of the wild son she had, she used to only answer, I have the hope that he too some day will be a son of God. It was impossible to say anything really bad about him. In all that related to his intercourse with the other sex, he was a model. It was known among his friends that no one dared say an evil word in his hearing. If it happened, at once his face assumed a serious, almost harsh expression, and he did not answer. Like all the pure of heart, Francis had great reverence for the mysteries of life. He was on the whole decorous in his life, and there was only one thing that really offended his family. It was that he clung so to his friends, that as he sat at the table in his home, if a message came from them, he would jump up, leave the meal, and going out, would not return to finish his repast. In one respect, he was worthy of admiration. This was his regard for the poor. His extravagance extended even to them. He was not one of those typical society men who hardly have a penny to give a beggar but willingly spend their hundreds on a champagne feast. His way of thinking was the following. If I am generous, yes, even extravagant with my friends who at the best only say thanks to me for them, or repay me with another invitation. How much greater grounds have I for almsgiving, which God himself has promised to repay a hundredfold? This was the inspiring life thought of the Middle Ages, which here carried out the genially literal and genially naive translation of the words of the gospel, as long as you did it to one of these, my least brethren, you did it to me. Francis knew, as the whole Middle Ages knew it, that not even a glass of cold water given by the disciples would remain unpaid and unrewarded by the Master. Therefore, a pang went through his heart when one day, as there was a crowd in the shop and he was in a hurry to get through, he had sent a beggar away. If this man had come from one of my friends, he said to himself, from count this or baron that, he would have got what he asked for. Now he comes from the King of Kings and from the Lord of Lords, and I let him go away empty-handed. I even gave him a repelling word. And he determined from that day on to give to everyone who asked him in God's name, per amor di Dio, as the Italian beggars still are wont to say. One effect of his kindness to the poor was perhaps this, as Bonaventure tells it, one of the original characters of the village, a half-witted or entire simpleton who traveled around the streets and byways, every time he met Francis, took off his cloak and spread it out on the ground and asked the young man to step upon it. Perhaps it was the same queer fellow, perhaps another of the wandering weaklings of the Middle Ages, who used to wander through the streets of Assisi calling out ceaselessly, Pox et bonum, peace and good. After Francis's conversion, this warning voice ceased, which is treated in the legend as a kind of precursor of the great saint's coming. Finally, Francis was endowed with a vivid feeling for nature, for it was in Provence that this sentiment, now so spontaneous in life as in literature, found a century later in the works of Petrarch its first literary expression since the days of antiquity. But already in the half-Provençal Francis it is found fully developed. The beauty of the country, the charm of the vineyards, all that was pleasing to the eye, rejoiced him, says Thomas of Celano. And we will not go wrong if we regard this feeling as a part of Francis's inheritance from his mother. This was then a notable element of his personality, 
and was temporarily only obscured by the spiritual crisis which preceded his conversion. As all good which is to grow, so must this side of his nature be pruned down even to the very roots, but only to bear a still richer crown. For as a German mystic has said, no one has a true love for created things unless he has first forsaken it for love of God, so that it has been dead for him and he dead for it. Chapter 3 History of the Epic Francis grew up in warlike times. Emperor was opposed to Pope, Prince to King, village was against village, and burgher against noble. Francis was but a child when Frederick Barbarossa, at the Peace of Constance, June 25, 1183 to 1196, had to grant the Lombardy states all the privileges which they, supported by the power of the papacy, had conquered for themselves in the Battle of Legnano, 1176. Barbarossa's successor, Henry VI, 1183 to 1196, meanwhile made the imperial power firm once more in Italy and the Sisi, which already in 1174 had been taken by the German royal chancellor, Archbishop Christian of Mayence, but which in 1177 had won its communal freedom with its own consuls, had to waive its municipal privileges and bow under the imperial Duke of Spoleto and Count of Assisi, Conrad of Erslingen. A year after the death of King Henry, Innocent III ascended the papal throne, and this powerful prince of the church immediately took the affairs of the Italian states into his own strong hand. Duke Conrad had to go to Narni and submit himself to the Pope, and his absence was at once utilized by the citizens for an assault by storm on the Zwingberg guarding castle, which threatening the city was enthroned on the top of Santa Rosso. The castle was taken and so thoroughly laid waste that when the papal emissary came to take possession of it as property of Peter, there was only a ruin left the same which still looks down upon Assisi. And to be prepared to take the consequences of this daring act, the citizens determined to erect a wall around their city. With spirit, all went to work, and in the course of an incredibly short time, the people of Assisi built the city wall with towers, which even today has an imposing effect upon the visitor. At this time, Francis was about 17 years old, and, as Sabatier says, it is not unreasonable to suppose that on this occasion he acquired that ability in handling stone and mortar, which later stood him in good stead at San Damiano in Portiuncula. Naturally, the greatest part of the work, both of tearing down and building up, was done by the lower people, minores, as it was the universal custom to call them. The common people thus realized their power, and after overcoming the foreign foe, the tyrannical German, they turned their attention to the foe at home, the minor tyrants, the noble lords, whose fortified residences, as later the Steens in the Flemish cities, stood here and there in the village. A real civil war broke out. The nobles' houses were besieged. Many of them were burned and the fall of the nobility seemed inevitable. Then the nobles of Assisi turned in their need to Assisi's former enemy, the neighboring and powerful Perugia. Ambassadors from Assisi's nobility promised to recognize Perugia's supremacy over the city whenever she could come to their assistance. The Republic of Perugia then stood at the summit of its power and greatness and eagerly seized the opportunity to reduce Assisi to subjection. Its army advanced into the field to the relief of the besieged nobility. The citizens of Assisi did not lose courage. Together with such of the nobility as had remained true to their ancestral city, they met the troops of Perugia at the bridge of San Giovanni on the plain between the two cities. Victory fell to the Perugians 
and a quantity of the combatants of Assisi were taken prisoners, among them also Francis. On account of his noble appearance, the young merchant's son was not put in prison with the rest of the citizens, but just as the laws of many old French cities provide for les bourgeois en robe, he received permission to share the lot of the nobility. The defeat at Ponte San Giovanni took place in the year 1202. The imprisonment in Perugia lasted a year, and during it, Francis astounded his fellow prisoners by his constant cheerfulness. Although there seemed little reason to be contented, he was always to be heard singing and joking, and when the others peevishly or angrily rebuked him, he answered only, Do you not know that a great future awaits me, and that all the world shall then fall down and pray to me? This is the first expression of his firm conviction of his future, the definite certainty that a great future belonged to him, which is so remarkable in St. Francis in these years of his youth. In November 1203, peace was declared between the two contending powers. The conditions were that the citizens of Assisi should repair the damage they had done to the property of the nobles, and that the nobles should, on their part, not be free to enter into any alliance without permission of the city. Francis was now liberated with the other prisoners, among whom he who had formerly been an apostle of happiness now assumed the role of peacemaker. For there was among the prisoner warriors one who, on account of his pride and unreasonableness, was very unpopular with all. Instead of avoiding this difficult character, Francis undertook to be in his company, and went so far in this direction, during the time of captivity, that the ill-humored, unreasonable prisoner changed, and was received into the circle of his companions, whence he had exiled himself. The long intercourse with the noble prisoners seems to have affected the young merchant's heart with a greater attachment to the ways of life of the nobility than ever, which in the years following the imprisonment, 1203 to 1206, became very evident in him. It was now that he became a disciple of the gay science of Provence. It was now that he submerged himself in the whirl of festivities and enjoyments, out of which his sickness, which in his 23rd year brought him so near to the portals of death, was first to rescue him and even at that, not too securely. Chapter 4. Francis Becomes a Soldier For even now he was a long way from conversion. He had realized his soul's barrenness, but he had found nothing with which to fill it. As his convalescence progressed and his strength returned, in such measure did he return to his worldly life, and trod again the same paths as before his sickness. The only difference was that he had no enjoyment now in the life he led. There was a sort of unrest in him that gave him no peace. There was a thorn in his soul that ceaselessly irritated him. More than ever he dreamed of great deeds, of strange adventures, and of achievements in strange and distant lands. And again, the life of chivalry presented itself to him as the only one which would assuage his soul's indefinable longing to attain the highest. From his youth he had been intimate with the romances of King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. He too would be a knight of the Holy Grail. He too would go out into the world, offer his blood for the cause of the greatest and highest, and for this was not excluded from his thoughts, he could return home crowned with undying laurels. Just at this time the Middle Ages' long-standing dispute between emperor and pope had entered on a new phase. Henry VI's widow had invoked the guardianship of Innocent III for the heir to the throne, afterwards the emperor Frederick II. One of the oldest of the emperor's generals, named Markwald, made the claim that it was he who, in virtue of the will, should properly be regent for king and kingdom. 
but Innocent had no idea of giving up what he had undertaken and was prepared to defend his cause with arms. The war was carried on in southern Italy because the widow queen Constance, being heir to the Norman kings, was also queen of Sicily. Innocent suffered for a long time, one defeat after another, until he entrusted his army to Duke Walter III of Brienne, who in the name of his Norman wife, Albinia, laid claim to Tarentum. This illustrious leader overcame the Germans in a series of defeats at Capua, at Lecce, at Barletta, and his fame spread over all Italy and inspired all the land. The Germans were hated everywhere. In Sicily, the word German signified coarse, impolite, unjust. The French troubadour Pierre Vidal wandered through Lombardy and sang sarcastic songs about the Germans. I would not be a nobleman in Friesland, he sang, if I had to hear the language they speak there. It sounds like geese, not like the language of men. All that was young, proud and noble in Italy rose against the foreign dominion, and Walter of Brienne's name seemed to wave over inspired ranks like a banner blessed by the Pope. The national inspiration reached even Assisi, one of the nobles of the place armed himself to go with a little troop to the aid of Walter's army in Apulia. As soon as Francis heard this, a feverish longing took possession of him. Here was the chance he so long had wished for. Here was the moment which must not be allowed to escape. Now or never was the time. The nobleman from Assisi should take Francis with him in his troop, and Duke Walter should knight him. With all his zeal, Francis pondered over the means of carrying this plan into effect. He was seized by wild joy, such as one feels when preparing for a new, and as one may hope, an entrancing epoch of life. A sort of wanderlust mastered him. He ran rather than walked through the streets. His friends found that his usual good humor had risen to an excessive height, and asked him the reason therefore when he would answer with glittering eyes, I know that I am now going to be a great prince. It goes without saying that nothing was spared in equipping the young merchant's son for war. One of his biographers says that all of his clothes were individual and costly. This was what was to be expected in the extravagant and luxurious rich young man. But what is also completely characteristic of him is that when, just before starting, he met one of his fellow travelers, a nobleman, and saw that he on account of his poverty could not clothe and arm himself properly, Francis gave all his costly equipment to him and took the nobleman's poor things in exchange. Engrossed as he was in the new life, he naturally dreamt every night of war and weapons. The very night after he had been so generous to the poor knight, such a dream came to him, and it seemed to him more pregnant with meaning than any of the others. It seemed to him that he, perhaps to bid farewell, stood in his father's shop, but instead of the rolls of goods which usually filled the shelves from floor to ceiling, he saw now on all sides shining shields, bright spears, shining armor, and as he wondered, he heard a voice which said, All this shall belong to you and to your warriors. It was only natural that Francis should take this dream for a good omen, and one bright morning he sprang upon his horse to go with the rest of the little troop to Apulia. Their road led them through the present Porta Nuovo to Foligno and from Foligno to Spoleto. Here they approached the Flaminian Way, the road to Rome and South Italy, and here Francis had nearly reached the goal of his warlike journey. For the same hand which had formerly cast him upon a sickbed to bring him to reflection and realization again grasped him in Spoleto. An attack of fever forced him to take to his bed, and as he lay there between sleeping and waking, It happened that he heard a voice asking him where he wanted to go. 
To Apulia to be a knight, was the invalid's answer. Tell me, Francis, who can benefit you most, the Lord or the servant? The Lord, answered Francis in astonishment. Then why do you desert the Lord, repeated the voice, for the servant, and the prince for his vassal? Then Francis knew who it was who spoke to him, and in the words of Paul cried out, Lord, what do you wish me to do? But the voice answered, Go back to your home. There it shall be told you what you are to do. For the vision you saw must be understood in another way. The voice ceased, and Francis awoke. The rest of the night he lay awake. But when morning came, he silently arose, saddled his horse, and rode back to Assisi in all his warlike equipment, which now suddenly seemed to him so vain. We do not know what reception awaited him at home, but we can imagine it. This, like all his other eccentricities, was undoubtedly soon forgiven him, and for a good while he was again the center of his friend's joyous circle. Soon the old life with feasting and enjoyment was in full swing, Again was Francis, the one who in spite of all had to be acknowledged as the leader of his circle of young men, Flos Juvenum. If his futile trip towards Apulia was referred to, he replied very definitely that he certainly had given it up, but only to do great things in his own land. He really had less confidence than he assumed. Opposing emotions contended in his soul, now he listened to the voice of the world only. Now he longed to serve the Lord whose inspiring voice had spoken so pleadingly to him that night in Spoleto. Stronger and stronger the feeling arose in him to withdraw from all, and in loneliness to become sure of his calling. But if he sought friends no more, they sought him, and to avoid all appearance of parsimony, he was the same luxurious host as before. And thus it happened that one evening, it was in the summer of 1205, invitations were sent out in his usual way for a festival which was to be richer and more sumptuous than ever. He was to be the king of the feast. And when the table was cleared, all joined in overwhelming him with praise and thanks. After the dinner, the company as usual went singing through the streets, but Francis, who kept a, a little behind the others, did not sing. Little by little he drooped behind his friends. Soon he was alone in the quiet night in some one of Assisi's small, steep streets, or in one of its small, open squares, from which one looks out so far over the landscape. And there it came to pass that the Lord again visited him. The heart of Francis, which was weary of the world and of its vanities, was filled with such a sweetness that there was room for no other feeling. He lost all consciousness of himself, and if he had been cut to pieces limb by limb, as he himself later told it, he would not have known it, would never have tried by a movement to escape it. How long he stood there overcome by the heavenly sweetness, he never knew. He first came back to himself when one of his friends, who had gone back in search of him, called out, Hello, Francis, are you thinking of your honeymoon? And looking up to heaven, where the stars were shining, then now as in the serene August night, the young man answered, Yes, I am thinking of marrying but the bride I am going to woo is nobler, richer, and fairer than any woman you know. Then his friends laughed, for a number had approached and the wine had made them loquacious. Then the tailor will again have a job just as when you started to Apulia, we may think some of them said with a sneer. Francis heard their laughter and was angry, but not with them. For in sudden light the whole of his former life was before him, in its folly, its lack of object, its childish vanity. 
he saw himself in all his pitiful reality, and in front of him stood in shining beauty the life he hitherto had not led, the true life, the just life, the beautiful, noble, rich life, life in Jesus Christ. In this aspect, Francis could be angry at no one but himself, and therefore the old legend says also that from that hour he began to value himself little. Chapter 5, The Conversion An author of the 15th century, St. Antonine of Florence, 1389-1459, in his Chronicles of the Church, has put the summary of Francis's activities in the first year which followed his parting from his friends and the joyous life into two lines. He now kept in hiding in hermit caves, and now piously built up ruined churches. Solitary prayer and personal work for the kingdom of God were the two means by which the rich man's son, young, spoiled, and worldly, sought to ascertain the will of God as applied to his own case. A little way outside of the city, there was a cave in the cliff where he liked to go to pray, sometimes alone, but oftener with one of his friends, the only one who seems to have remained true to him after his change of mind. None of his biographers has preserved for us this man's name. Thomas of Chalino only says that he was a distinguished person. Francis had by nature a strong inclination to speak of his experiences. His biographers say of him that even against his will he would speak of things which occupied him. It is no wonder that he confided in a friend, and in the metaphor of the Bible, told of the costly treasure which he had found in the cave outside the city, and which only needed to be dug out of the soil but he had to be alone to raise the treasure. Therefore, he left his friend outside while he went in by himself. And there apart, in the dark cave, Francis found the secret chamber where he could pray to his heavenly Father. Day by day, the desire to do the will of God increased until he had no peace, until he had clearly determined what it was that God asked of him. Again and again were the words of the psalmist on his lips, the words which are the foundation of all true worship of God. Show, O Lord, thy ways to me, and teach me thy paths. Psalm 24, verse 4. And against this pure ideal, his past life stood out dark and repulsive. With increasing bitterness, he thought of his past youth, and it delighted him no longer to think over its delights and extravagances. But what was to be done not to fall back again? Had he not time and again been warned, and had he not time and again despised the warning, and again followed his inclinations? When friends again called on him, when the wine once more seduced him, when the smell of the feast again reached him, and the sounds of violin and lute rang in his ears, would he then have power to resist? Would he not, as before, immerse himself in the glad world of festivity and drinking, which hovered like a golden heaven over the dark, everyday world? Francis did not depend upon himself, and God seemed unwilling to give him the desired word of help which he asked for. In agony of mind and desolation of soul, Francis fought the battle of his salvation in the loneliness and darkness of the cave. And when he finally, torn and tortured, again approached in the light of day, his friends hardly recognized him. His face seemed so haggard. Thus Francis became a man of prayer. He had begun to taste the sweetness of prayer and prayed continually. It often happened that as he would be going through the streets or about his home, he would stop everything to go off into a church to pray. Francis's father seems to have been away from home a great deal during this period of change in his son's nature. The mother who, according to the authorities, 
loved Francis more than her other children, let him do just what he wished. In one sense, he had the same life as before, only that the poor had taken the place of his friends. It was they he sought. It was to them he gave feasts. One day when his mother and he were to sit at table together, he laid out such a quantity of bread that there was enough for a large family. When his mother asked the reason for such profusion, he answered that he had intended it all for the poor. If he met a beggar in the street who asked for alms, he gave him all the money he had with him. But if his money was all gone, he would give him his hat or his belt. Sometimes when he had nothing else, he would take the poor man with him to a secluded place, take off his shirt and give it to him. He also began to think about poor priests and poor churches. He bought church goods and sent them secretly to places where they were wanting. This is the first indication we have of Francis's vivid interest manifest in his afterlife for everything relating to churches and which, among others, found expression in his sending to all provinces good and fine irons to make fine and white altar bread with. But first of all, the poor were in his thoughts. To see them, to hear their troubles, to help them in their necessities, these were hereafter his principal concerns. And little by little the desire was firmly established within his heart if I could only find by personal experience how it felt to be poor, how it is to be not one of those who go by and throw down a shilling, but to be the one who stands in rags and dirt and humbly bowing, stretches out his faded hat for alms. Many a time we may think he stood among the beggars at some church door, stood among them while they pitifully asked for a mite, but it was not like him to do only this. He himself must do the begging in order to understand poverty. And this could not be done in Assisi where everyone knew him. It was this which inspired him with the idea of going on a pilgrimage to Rome. There in the great city, no one knew him. There he could put his plan into execution. Perhaps there were some particular circumstances which brought near to him this idea of a pilgrimage to the Apostle's grave. From September 14, 1204, until March 25, 1206, and again from April 4 until May 11, 1206, Innocent III had transferred the papal residence to the bishopric of St. Peter. So long a stay by the unhealthy waters of the Tiber may have had some connection with special church functions in St. Peter's, perhaps the granting of some indulgence. The Bishop of Assisi at this time was also going on a journey to Rome. However all this may be, Francis went to Rome. We know only a little of his first visit to the Eternal City. He approached by the Flaminian Way and apparently at once went to St. Peter's. Here he met many other pilgrims and saw that they, as was the custom in the Middle Ages, threw coins as offerings through the fenestrella or grated window of the Apostle's tomb. The majority of the gifts were only small pieces. Francis stood a while and watched then the last sign of his old desire to show off appeared. He pulled out his well-filled purse and threw a whole handful of coins in through the grating, so that the money flew about and rang as it fell, and all the people were astonished and looked at him. The next minute, Francis had left the church and called one of the beggars aside, and a moment after, he had at last fulfilled the purpose of the whole journey. As a real beggar, clothed in real rags, he stood among the other beggars on the steps which led up to the church. Of his sensations at this moment, we know enough when we read in one of his biographers that he begged in French, which he liked to talk, although he never could do it perfectly. For him, French was the language of poetry, 
the language of religion, the language of his happiest memories and of his most solemn hours, the language he spoke when his heart was too full to find expression in everyday Italian, and therefore his soul's mother speech. When Francis talked French, those who knew him knew that he was happy. How long Francis stayed in Rome is unknown to us. He may have started back the day after his arrival. The authorities only say that after he had shared the beggar's meal, he took off the borrowed clothes, put on his own, and went home to Assisi. He had now had the great experience of what it was to be poor. He had worn rags and eaten the bread of necessity, and although it must have been a happiness to be in his own good clothes again and to sit at home at his mother's profuse table, yet he also felt the spiritual fascination which contentment and poverty can inspire. What a delight it can be to own nothing on this earth except a drink of water from the spring, a crust of bread from the hand of a merciful man, and a night's lodging under the blue heavens with its shining stars. Why should he be troubled about so many things, about goods and money, house and garden, people and flocks, when so little is enough? Does not the gospel say, Blessed are the poor? And it is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Questions of this sort certainly troubled Francis after his return from Rome. With greater zeal than ever, he called out to God for guidance and light. The friend who used to accompany him to the cave seems now to have wearied of going on this search for treasures that was always fruitless. The only man to whom Francis now and then revealed himself was Bishop Guido of Assisi, who probably was his confessor. The light cast upon this period by the testament which Francis has left us has therefore a special value for us. In this document, which was written the year before the saint's death, we are told, The Lord granted me to begin my conversion, so that as long as I lived in my sins, I felt it very bitter to see the lepers. But the Lord took me among them, and I exercised mercy towards them. For the lepers occupied a very particular position among the sick and poor of the Middle Ages, based on a passage in the prophet Isaiah, chapter 53, verse 4, the lepers were looked upon as an image of the Redeemer, more than all other sufferers. As early as the days of Gregory the Great, we find the story of the monk Martyrius, who met a leper by the wayside, who from pain and weariness was fallen to the ground and could drag himself no further. Martyrius wrapped the sick man in his cloak and carried him to his convent. But the leper changed in his arms to Jesus himself, who rose to heaven as he blessed the monk and said to him, Martyrius, thou art not ashamed of me on earth, I will not be ashamed of thee in heaven. A similar legend is told of St. Julian, of St. Leo IX, and of the blessed Columbini. And so the lepers were more than any others an object for pious care during the Middle Ages. For them was founded a special order of knights, Knights of Lazarus, whose whole office was to take care of the lepers. So too there were erected all over Europe the numerous houses of St. George where the lepers were taken care of in a sort of cloistered life. Of these lepers' homes there were 19,000 in the 13th century. But in spite of everything, the life of the leper was sad enough. They were repulsed by the rest of humanity, and they were hedged in by severe laws isolating them and hemming them in on all sides. As with all other cities, there was also in the vicinity of Assisi a leper's hospital. The lepers were in fact the first real hospital patients, and in some languages their name expresses this fact. 
The hospital lay midway between Assisi and Portiuncula, near where the words Casa Gualdi appear over the entrance to a large estate. It was called San Salvatore della Pariti, and was owned by an order of crucigers founded under Alexander III for the care of the lepers. On his walks in this place, Francis now and then passed by the hospital, but the mere sight of it had filled him with horror. He would not even give an alms to a leper unless someone else would take it for him, especially when the wind blew from the hospital and the weak, nauseating odor peculiar to the leper came across the road, he would hurry past with averted face and fingers in his nostrils. It was in this that he felt his greatest weakness, and in it he was to win his greatest victory. For one day, as he was as usual calling upon God, it happened that the answer came, and the answer was this. Francis, everything which you have loved and desired in the flesh, it is your duty to despise and hate, if you wish to know my will. And when you have begun thus, all that which now seems to you sweet and lovely will become intolerable and bitter, and all which you used to avoid will turn itself to great sweetness and exceeding joy. These were the words which at last gave Francis a definite program which showed him the way he was to follow. He certainly pondered over these words in his lonely rides over the Umbrian plain, and just as he one day woke out of reverie, he found the horse making a sudden movement, and saw on the road before him, only a few steps distant, a leper in his familiar uniform. Francis started, and even his horse shared in the movement and his first impulse was to turn and flee as fast as he could. But there were the words he had heard within himself so clearly before him. What you used to abhor shall be to you joy and sweetness. And what had he hated more than the lepers? Here was the time to take the Lord at his word, to show his good will. And with the mighty victory over himself, Francis sprang from the horse, approached the leper, from whose deformed countenance the awful odor of corruption issued forth, placed his alms in the outstretched wasted hand, bent down quickly, and kissed the fingers of the sick man, covered with the awful disease, whilst his system was nauseated with the action. When he again sat upon his horse, he hardly knew how he had got there. He was overcome by excitement. His heart beat, he knew not whither he rode. But the Lord had kept his word. Sweetness, happiness, and joy streamed into his soul, flowed and kept flowing, although his soul seemed full and more full, like the clear stream which, filling an earthen vessel, keeps on pouring and flows over its rim with an ever clearer, purer stream. The next day, Francis voluntarily wandered down the road he had hitherto always avoided, the road to San Salvatore della Pareti. And when he reached the gate, he knocked, and when it was opened to him, he entered. From all the cells, the sick came swarming out, came with their half-destroyed faces, blind, inflamed eyes, with club feet, with swollen, corrupted arms and fingerless hands. And all this dreadful crowd gathered around the young merchant. And the odor from their unclean swellings was so strong that Francis, against his will for a moment, had to hold his breath to save himself from sickness. But he soon recovered control of himself. He drew out the well-filled purse he had brought with him and began to deal out his alms. And on every one of the dreadful hands that were reached out to take his gifts, he imprinted a kiss, as he had done the day before. Thus it was that Francis won the greatest victory man can win, the victory over oneself. 
From now on, he was master of himself, and not like the most of us, his own slave. But even the greatest victor in the spiritual field must be ever on the watch for his always vigilant enemy. Francis had conquered in great things. The tempter tried now to bring him to defeat in small things. Francis continued as before to go every day to his oratory in the cave outside the city to pray there. Now it often happened that on the way there he met a humpbacked old woman, one of the common deformed creatures who, in the South, so willingly betake themselves to the sheltering obscurity of the churches. They can be seen there all day long, rattling their rosaries or dozing in a corner, but the instant a stranger approaches, they draw the kerchief around their heads, limp out from their corner, and mutter piteously with outstretched hand, Un soldo, signore, un soldo, signorino mio, a penny, sir, a penny, sir. Such a pitiful old beggar was it who now every day limped across the young man's path, and it happened that in the newly converted young soul there arose a repugnance and a resistance, a repugnance to the dirt and misery of the old woman, a resistance to her troublesome ways and to her persistency. And as he went on his way, and the sun shone, and the fields were green, and the distant mountains shone gray-blue, a voice whispered within him, And are you willing to give up all this? Are you willing to abandon it all? You will give up light and sun, life and joy, the cheerful open-air feasts, and will shut yourself up in a cave and waste your best years in useless prayers, and finally become an old fool, shaking with the palsy, who pitifully wanders about from church to church, and perhaps in secret, sighs and mourns over his wasted life. Thus the wicked enemy whispered into the young man's soul, and this was the moment when Francis's youth and light loving eyes and knightly soul weakened. But as he reached his cave, he always succeeded in conquering himself. And the harder the struggle had been, the deeper was the peace which followed, the joy and the hope, all in converse with God. Chapter 6 The Message in San Damiano. God gave me also, thus St. Francis speaks, where in his testament he speaks of his youth, God gave me also so great a confidence in the churches that I simply prayed and said this, We pray to thee, Lord Jesus Christ, here and in all thy churches all over the whole world, and we bless thee, because with thy holy cross thou hast redeemed the world. And then the Lord gave me, and still gives me so great a confidence in priests, who live by the right of the Holy Roman Church, that if they ever persecuted me, I would for the sake of their consecration say nothing about it. And if I had the wisdom of Solomon, and traveled in the parishes of poor priests, yet I would not preach without their permission. And them, and all other priests, I will fear, love and honor as my superiors, and I will not look on their faults, for I see God's Son in them, and they are my superiors. And I do this because, here on earth, I see nothing of the Son of the highest God, except His most holy body and blood, which the priests receive, and which only they give to others. And these solemn secrets I will honor and venerate above everything, and keep them in the most sacred places. We have here from the last year of Francis's life the most authentic testimony as to his feeling all through his life towards the church and the clergy. And this testimony, coming from himself, accords exactly with all that his biographers tell us about the same phase of his character. It has already been told how Francis showed his interest in church affairs in supplying poor churches with proper vestments and the like. The environs of Assisi, even today, contain enough of such small churches 
road and field chapels, often half in ruin. Their doors are frequently locked, so seldom are they used. One can look into them through low windows, outside of which kneeling benches are often placed, and on the altar there will be seen a torn cloth laid awry, wooden vases with dusty paper flowers, and wooden candlesticks which were once gilded but are now cracked and gray. Nevertheless, there can be something very devotional in such lonely deserted churches. If they are open so that one can enter, perhaps on the walls will be found half-obliterated old frescoes painted by those disciples of Giotto or Simone Martini, who in the 14th century seemed to have personally visited the most remote of the smaller cities and villages of the Apennines. The holy water font is long empty and full of dust, but as one kneels in prayer, the wind is heard sighing through the chestnut groves, or a mountain stream foams in the solemn loneliness. The old church of San Damiano, a little outside of and below the city, was such a half-ruined chapel in the time of Francis's youth. The road to it has not changed much in the seven centuries which have passed, it slopes rather steeply and passes by a broad whitewashed house with large yellow grain houses of the shape of beehives around it and among the olive groves where the corn grows luxuriantly under the gnarled olive trees fine silver gray web of branches and leaves in 15 minutes walking san damiano is reached which now is a convent occupied by brown franciscans in the days of Francis's youth, San Damiano was only a little tottering field chapel whose material adornment consisted of a large Byzantine crucifix over the high altar. In front of this crucifix, Francis was often wont to pray, and thus it happened to him that once, a little while after his visit to the lepers, he knelt one day in prayer before the image of the crucified one within the church of San Damiano. After he had placed himself in thought upon the cross for the first time, this spiritual crucifixion became a favorite exercise for his meditations. With an imploring gaze fixed upon the hallowed countenance of Jesus, he uttered the following prayer, which tradition has preserved for us. Great and glorious God, my Lord, Jesus Christ, I implore thee to enlighten me and to dispel the darkness of my soul. Give me true faith and firm hope and a perfect charity. Grant me, O Lord, to know thee so well that in all things I may act by thy light and in accordance with thy holy will. The whole of the young man's striving in the year that had passed since he had stood on the roadside not far from San Damiano and had found the world empty and his soul a waste, are gathered together and framed in this simple and profound prayer. This it was that he had always sought for and wished for through all his errors and weakness, light to see the will of God and to act in accordance therewith. The whole of his life from that time up to this moment had been one reception in many forms, but with increasing fervor of the words, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. And so it came to pass that God deigned to speak to this servant, Francis. From the crucifix came a voice that could only be heard within the heart. And what the voice said was this, now go hence, Francis, and build up my house, for it is nearly falling down. And just as that time in Spoleto, when he was commanded to abandon his journey to Aquila, Francis was at once ready to obey the divine message. Simple and literal as he was, he looked about him in the old chapel and saw that it was nearly falling down. And trembling under the solemnity of the moment, 
he answered the crucified one who had vouchsafed to speak to him, Lord, with joy will I do what thou wishest. At last God had heard his prayer. At last God had set him to work. And quick in his movements as Francis was, he at once set to work to carry out the Lord's directions. Outside the door he found the priest of the place, a poor old father, sitting in the sun on a stone bench. The young man approached him deferentially, kissed his hand in greeting, took out his purse, and gave to the astonished priest a considerable sum of money, saying, I beg you to buy oil with this money, so that there shall always be a lamp burning before the crucifix within, and you may let me know when there is no more, and I will supply it again. Before the old priest could recover from his astonishment, Francis was gone. His heart was overflowing, his soul was trembling with the great event that had happened to him. As he went along, he made now and then the sign of the cross, and it seemed as if he each time imprinted deeper and deeper the image of the crucified one upon his heart. Unsurpassably true and incomparably beautiful, the old legend goes on to say that from that hour the thought of the sufferings of our Lord made Francis's heart melt, so that he, from now on, as long as he lived, bore in his heart the wounds of our Lord Jesus. But more money was needed to build up San Damiano's church than what Francis had with him at the moment. But in the interim, he had not the least doubt as to how he should get the necessary means. As fast as his feet could carry him, he hurried home, took some rolls of fine cloth out of the shop, loaded a pack horse with it, and took the road to Foligno to bring his goods to the market in this large neighboring city as he had been wont to do. In the course of a short time, he had sold both goods and horse and was back with the money to San Damiano. The distance between the two places is only a couple of miles and Francis rode on the outward trip. Perhaps he found the priest still on the stone bench sunning himself as he returned. In any case, the young man found him and as he again greeted him reverentially, he put the whole sum of money, no inconsiderable one, which his transaction had brought him, into the priest's lap, with the words that it was for the restoration of the church. The priest had accepted the former and less considerable alms, but when Francis now came with all this sum of money and wished to give it to him, he feared that something was wrong and said no. Perhaps he thought that it was one of the young society man's wild impulses and that the gift was not seriously meant. In any case, he wanted to stand well with Pietro di Bernardone and was therefore determined to have nothing more to do with the affair. In vain did Francis sit down by the side of the old priest and use all his powers of persuasion to weaken his determination. All was futile. Francis only obtained this much. The priest would permit him to live at San Damiano for a while, to devote himself without interruption to prayer and works of piety. From now on, Francis was virtually ordained to lead what was called in the Middle Ages a religious life, that is to say, the life of a monk or hermit. He did not think of entering a convent, in his testament, he says himself that no one showed him the way to his vita religiosa, but that the Almighty taught it to him. But in referring to the change that came to him at this time, he uses the exact classical expression in the same place, which designates the entering an order to leave the world. Exivi de seculo, he says, I abandoned the world. The time he was now to spend with the priest in San Damiano can be properly regarded as his novitiate, but a novitiate in which the Spirit of God alone was his teacher, director, and taskmaster. Near the priest's house there was a cave, 
and true to his custom, Francis had chosen this as his prayer chamber. Here he spent nights and days in prayer and fasting, with tears and unspeakable groanings. While these things were occurring, Pietro di Bernardone had been on one of his business trips. Now he returned home and did not find his son. Pica did not know what had become of him, or if she did know, would not tell. But however this may be, the old merchant soon found his son's hiding place and betook himself thither, but did not find Francis, who was hidden in his cave. Meanwhile, the priest seems to have utilized the opportunity to give Pietro di Bernardone the money from his son's business transaction. Francis had laid it aside in a window recess in the church. The disappearance of the cloth and of the horse had naturally been one of the causes of the coming of Pietro di Bernardone. After he had recovered the money, he went home much quieted and spent a whole month without making any new attempt to find or to speak to his firstborn. Food was meanwhile brought to him in the cave from his home, probably by his mother's contrivance. It is fair to say that Francis employed this month to imbue himself in the great thought which from now on presented itself to him as the essence of Christianity, the life of Christ, the crucified, in every one of the faithful. The Epistle of Paul to the Romans is one of the biblical writings Francis most frequently quotes. It is precisely in this book that Paul appears more strongly than elsewhere to be not only the great Christian dogmatic, but also the great Christian mystic. This is neither scientific hypothesis nor flower of literature, but is in accordance with the facts when I find the emotions of the young son of the Italian merchant in this time of proof and probation at San Damiano expressed in these words of the eighth chapter of the Epistle to the Romans. There is now, therefore, no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, who walk not according to the flesh. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath delivered me from the law of sin and of death, that the justification of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For if you live according to the flesh, you shall die, but if by the Spirit you mortify the deeds of the flesh, you shall live. For whosoever are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For the Spirit himself giveth testimony to our spirit that we are the sons of God. And if sons, heirs also, heirs indeed of God, and joint heirs with Christ. Yet so, if we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified with him. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be made conformable to the image of his Son. It is probable that to this month at San Damiano, we may assign an occurrence preserved for us in the legends without any more exact chronology. Francis was seen one day wandering around on the plain below Assisi in the vicinity of a little old chapel which was called Portiuncula, or Santa Maria degli Angeli, Our Lady of the Angels. He wandered around the chapel, sighing and weeping, as if overcome by a great sorrow. A passerby approached him and asked in sympathy what had gone wrong with him and why he wept. Then Francis answered, I am weeping over the sufferings of my Lord Jesus Christ and I will not be ashamed to wander around the whole world and weep over them. This so affected the stranger that he too began to shed tears, and they wept together. Thus for Francis of Assisi, the life began, not after the flesh, but after the spirit, which was to lead him ever higher, until he approached as near as man can attain to the image of Jesus Christ, the Crucified.